No. Oh, this is what we're going to watch. What a Russian assault on Ukraine would look like. By the Caspian the report. Uh, you know, listen. I got some, I got some people living under the, uh, uh, the Russian thumb that wanted me to watch this, so I'm going to watch Russia it. Russia is at its highest combat readiness since the collapse of the Soviet Union. According to Ukrainian intelligence, 127,000 Russian troops have gathered near Ukraine's borders. A portion of the mobilization is part of a joint exercise with Belarus, but the facts on the ground give the Russian leadership the option of attacking Ukraine from the east, south and north. Russia's military advantage is overwhelming. It could assault Ukraine at very short notice. However, a Russian assault on Ukraine with the mission to capture the capital Kiev would ignite a conflict on a scale not seen since Iraq in 2003. So how would a Russian attack on Ukraine go down? And what would constitute Russia's ultimate objective? I'm your host Shirvan and welcome to Caspian Report. Shirvan! Today's episode is sponsored by Curiosity Sorry. Stream, a streaming service that offers thousands of documentaries from some of the year. That is a terrific deal and a good way to support Caspian Report because it lets us make more content. Now, if you want to test... Is he Aussie? He is, right? ...during the sign-up process. The well-being of a nation, its peace and prosperity is unattainable unless and until its security is firmly established. <laughs> I hate this guy. Yes, he is. <laughs> what the fuck? In Russia, security overrules all other socio-economic considerations. At times, those security interests even intrude into the political affairs of its neighbors. The Kremlin has a particular allergy to democracy. That's just how it's wired. Whether it's in Belarus... I cover the German elections, you will cover the Portuguese elections? Are you insane? Why would you compare Portugal to fucking Germany, dude? Kazakhstan or Ukraine, Russia cannot tolerate a democratically governed neighbor. A democracy at its doorstep would inevitably look to the West to develop its legitimacy and liberal values, aligning with institutions like the EU and NATO in the process. Of course, this is how the Russians see it. Whether true or false doesn't matter. The Kremlin shapes its foreign policy according Oh shit. Then shapes see it. Whether true or false doesn't matter. The Kremlin shapes its foreign policy according to that. Azeri is it means uh, uh, Azeri are are Turkic people living in Azerbaijan. They speak like a type of Turkish that is incomprehensible to me, but they can understand my type of Turkish. That's what that is. In Ukraine, the 2014 revolution brought forth democratic rule in Kyiv. Fast forward a few years and Ukraine is now in its final phase of a geopolitical realignment by looking to join the EU and NATO. Yet what makes Ukraine a special case is its geography. The flat terrain of Ukraine merges seamlessly with Russian territory. No geographic features mark the international boundaries. Should Ukraine join NATO, Russia would have to increase military spending and expand the size of its army to secure its western flank. So at best, NATO expansion into Ukraine would bankrupt Russia, both militarily and economically. At worst, NATO presence in Ukraine would threaten Russia's territorial integrity. Ukraine's Black Sea coast is only about 750 kilometers to the Caspian Sea. A professional military could move across that distance in a day or two. Doing so would result in a land bridge that cuts the Russian heartland from the North Caucasus, paralyzing the Russian state. The final element that gives urgency to the Ukrainian crisis is timing. Kyiv is buying strategic arms left and right. Firstly, it has a growing stockpile of anti-tank missiles, supplied mainly by the United States and the United Kingdom. Secondly, Ukraine has- You just broke the heart of a good Portuguese friend.
Didn't we watch a video in this guy and he was very wrong? I don't remember. Also established licensed facilities to produce Turkish combat drones, which have proved deadly effective Let's go. against Russian weaponry. And thirdly, Ukraine is looking to develop... Let's go, Turkey! It's good when Turkey sends weapons to Ukraine, but it's bad when America does it. I'm just kidding. Please don't take that seriously. ...missile program of its own. One that can like threaten the Russian heartland mass. in the same way Russia threatens the Ukrainian heartland. In time, whether it's five years or ten years, the proliferation of strategic weapons will make invading Ukraine exceedingly costly. The country will gradually- Bro, this guy is often wrong. Geopolitical analysts have often proven him wrong. Okay, what the fuck is a geopolitical analyst? Everyone, when it comes to talking about global conflicts, is wrong in some way. I'm wrong. The entire uh, national security apparatus and the, in the entirety of the CIA is wrong. There is no right. When historical events are happening right in front of our eyes, normative, uh, normative declarations are often going to be wrong, okay? No matter what you describe, no matter what you talk about, there's always going to be a level of fucking wrong. Because states operate as like individual humans, okay? Think about it like that. They have their own interests. And not only that, but... I mean, it, it, okay, let me just explain it this way. There are some people that are more wrong, okay? And consistently more wrong. Or ideologies that are more violent than others... No matter what the assessment that you're making, when you look at, uh, like, current affairs globally, there is always still going to be uh, things that you get wrong because it's very difficult to uh, assess the situation on the ground. Even if you're literally on the fucking ground, you're going to have a hard time assessing the situation. Okay? And more importantly than that, the news media that you get from that is always going to be one-sided. That's why I always go back to Turkey and talk about Turkey whenever I'm describing, like, si the situation in Venezuela. No matter what you get, no matter what kind of information you get about... Uh, about a certain thing happening overseas... It's always going to be clouded by uh, material interest that the, the party has. Make no mistake, I'm not defending Caspian Report because I don't know uh, what his point of view is. I'm sure no matter what, his POV, if he's, especially if he's from Azerbaijan, uh, his, his POV is probably going to be a little bit uh, different, right? Um, but not necessarily, not necessarily bad. But this is a country that has uh, been under... I mean, this is a post-Soviet country. Actually be better equipped to defend itself and harbor weapons to strike into Russian territory. The longer Russia waits, the longer it puts off an invasion, the stronger Ukraine gets and the costlier Russia's battle plans become. So, as grim as it sounds, it's better to act quickly than to hesitate until the time of action is past. How the Russian leadership will proceed is anyone's guess. The threat, however, is real, in both political and Three geographic months, terms, yeah. as well as in timing. Should the Kremlin decide to take its chances and attack Ukraine, there are a few strategies to go for. The most credible battle plan comes from the alleged CIA interception. You did a video recently on Turkish military power that was a little biased? What do you mean? That it said that it was incredibly powerful, in which case it was not biased and it's real. ...of Russian military communications in early 2021. While the contents of the interception remain classified, NATO officials talking to the German newspaper Bild 
summed up the Russian plan as follows. Should war commence, the Russian army could strike from Donbass in the east, Belarus in the north, and Crimea in the south. The assault would come in three distinct phases, thereby allowing breathing room for diplomatic concessions. After taking a specific region, and if negotiations fail, the Russian army could move on to the next target, and so on, until Kiev rebukes and Moscow's political objective is met. Either way, the first phase is likely to focus on southern Ukraine. Russian tanks and troops coming from Crimea would take the coastline and surround the city of Odessa. Meanwhile, a Russian amphibious landing operation would cut Ukraine off from the Black Sea while strengthening the supply lines going into Crimea. Interestingly, six Russian amphibious ships departed the Baltic Sea in mid-January, heading towards the Atlantic Ocean. It is believed their destination is the Black Sea, which makes an amphibious assault all the more feasible. Eventually though, the Russians would want to join their forces north of Odessa and then advance as far as Transnistria, a Russian-backed separatist region legally part of Moldova. At the same time, still in phase one, Russian special forces would infiltrate the southern portion of the Dnieper River. Their mission would be to disrupt Ukrainian logistics going across the river. Russia's vast artillery forces in Crimea would coordinate their attacks with the special forces on the ground, thereby tying up Ukrainian forces. Likewise, from the east in Donbas, Russian troops backed by the Air Force would take a chunk of eastern Ukraine and then take the cities of Dnipro and Zaporozhnya by the Dnieper River. From there, the Russians would be free to advance towards Crimea and form a continuous land bridge going from Donbas to Transnistria. As soon as southern Ukraine comes under Russian control, the Kremlin would start dictating terms for a political surrender. If that doesn't work, it's on to phase two. Coming from the northeast, Russian How much is incredible? He's not saying this is what's going to happen. He's saying if Russia were to invade uh, Ukraine, then this is how they would do it. Infantry this is how they could do it. Around Ukraine's second largest city, Kharkiv. Backed by the Air Force, the Russian army would advance on Poltova and anchor by the Dnieper. Kharkiv and Poltova would be encircled, gas, electricity, and food supplies would be cut off. A few weeks into the siege, the cities would likely capitulate. In the second phase, Russia would have taken much of Ukrainian territories east of the Dnieper. Yo, motherfuckers would be like, never play here, uh, Hearts of Iron on stream, unwatchable. And then they literally froth out of the mouth when, this, when they watch this, which is exactly the same. Okay? Like, they're like, oh, poggers, this is sick. Don't, don't play the other game, but like this, this is sick. The second round of negotiations would start, and if these fail as well, Russia would launch phase three of its plan. In this final push, Russian troops would seek to take a chunk of western Ukraine, but crossing the Dnieper might get tricky. The safest way to cross the river is not to cross it, but to no, move from Belarus into be western be Ukraine. One, I would know. never play Hearts of Iron, are you kidding me? It's a fucking, I hate spreadsheets. I became an I became on camera talent partially because I hate hate spreadsheets, okay? Almost as much as I hate the top of the hour ad break, which is why I always tell you you can avoid the ad break at the top of the hour by subscribing for five dollars or for free with a Twitch Prime. Okay? Yeah, it's fucking annoying that everybody is top of the hour watching right now. You're pocket watching, you're top of the hour watching, but you're never watching your back and protecting your six like Ukraine did by subscribing or by, you know, getting gifted a sub. You're lucky and a good boy. But most of you aren't lucky or good, which is why you have to make your own luck and be a good boy by subscribing on your own for $5 or for free with the Twitch Prime. Here's the one-minute ad break now. I can't fucking take it anymore. Ad break single-handedly ruined my life. The other day, my teacher was teaching us geology and he mentioned at the top of the mount and I immediately thought top of the hour pago snowball time I can't look at a tomato in the store without breaking down and fucking crying I can't eat pasta without thinking tomato sauce pago tomato time 
any primers. Thank you, James Five Ho, for the five get the subs. In December last year, President Lukashenko stated that Belarus would do everything to bring Ukraine back into the fold. That means Belarus would serve as a launching platform, not that it would have much of a choice. Either way, from Belarus, Russian troops would move into the west of Ukraine, but they would have to go around the Chernobyl radiation zone and take the town of Koroshtyn first. At the same time, a second Russian contingent would move from Russia into the remainder of northeast Ukraine. Afterwards, in typical pincer movement tactics, the two northern contingents would simultaneously advance on Kiev. Kiev. The Ukrainian capital would come under siege from the east and west. Now, Kiev is a large metropolitan site, so the Russians would likely wait outside and force the Ukrainian government to capitulate. By the end of phase three, roughly two thirds of Ukraine would come under Russian control. However, no plan survives first contact with the enemy, and Ukraine is no pushover. Going by the official numbers, it has a standing army of 145,000 troops, with an estimated 300,000 veterans on standby. Ukraine has also been stockpiling arms and ammunition for years, even acquiring some high-tech weaponry from abroad. But its arsenal is not yet large enough to change the battlefield. Russia, on the contrary, has very capable artillery, rocket and missile systems. Its air power Goddamn. is substantial, and it has the world's largest fleet of tanks. Russian weapons could devastate not, Ukrainian not. military units from afar. In an all-out war, Ukraine would see thousands of casualties within the first hour, and thousands more the days following. So make no mistake about it, the consequences would be terrifying, and the shock would trigger millions to flee zero, west. Batches, Yet for batches, Russia, the real zero, challenge batches, would zero, be the batches. resulting insurgency. According yep. to a poll by the Kiev International Institute of Sociology, one third of Ukraine's citizens are willing to take up armed resistance. Those are alarming numbers for the Russians. Based on US military doctrine, to successfully counter an insurgency, the occupation force needs a ratio of one counterinsurgent per 20 residents. Adjusted for Ukraine's 44 million 44 citizens, million one -third. that would mean the Russians would need at least 325,000 boots on the ground to occupy the Ukrainian territory while containing an insurgency. A force that size... They literally do not have the money. Like, there is no shot. No fucking shot. If they were to if they were to invade Ukraine, the amount of money that they would have to spend is insane. They do no fucking shot, dude. America can't deal with a fucking insurgency in Afghanistan. You're just ridiculous to assume that Russia would be able to do such a thing in Ukraine when all they need to do is fucking uh all they, all they need to do is install a puppet leadership. Why would they do that? The American military is so bad, though. What, you think the Russian military is so much better? Like, Just they're militaries, mind. dude. They're still That's comprised the of the same kind of fucking I human beings, okay? The idea that, like, one country's... The idea that one country's fucking military is, like, better than other... Better than others, uh, like, that other person was saying, like, America has that they-them military. Like, okay. That's completely meaningless. No one has, like tough people you have tough insurgents like yes the taliban are tougher than the american military 100 percent. okay you can maybe talk about special forces being better equipped than other countries special forces but ultimately when you talk about boots on the ground warfare it comes down to firepower it comes down to tanks missiles drone strikes shit like that it's it's not about like oh man the Russian soldiers are so brave. The They'll US say Sukobliat and Kakdila and then fucking Kakdibezovut. You know, and American soldiers are gay and scared. Like, that's not real. That's not a real thing. Uh oh. See y'all of Fox News in 24 hours? Hold on. Let's. 
like people unironically think the American military goes into Afghanistan and just like fucking uh, engages in all out warfare when it's all when it's a whole bunch of holding your dick uh, on, you know, unoccupied poppy fields. OK, building forward operating bases. Shitting in like, uh, you know, shitting in horrible situations in the fucking dead of the summer heat. Okay. Sometimes a bomb blows up. And then as soon as someone fires at you from the fucking mountaintop, you get down, assume a position uh, of cover and immediately call for firepower from above. That's it. It's not like, it's not like World War One. You know what I mean? You're not like. Love you has. You're just sitting around waiting for you're sitting around in cover waiting for fucking uh, someone from above to just fucking laser the, the top of the mountain. It has nothing to do with like how courageous or brave our soldiers are. It's about how quickly the the <laughs> how quickly air support can come in and fucking laser the top of the mountain. I know, I say top of the, and you guys literally have PTSD. <laughs> Don't talk to me about Afghanistan. The top of the hour is my Afghanistan. <laughs> I had an abusive streamer. <laughs> Don't talk to me about Afghanistan. <laughs> I had a relationship with an abusive streamer my whole life. And the top of the, every time he said top of the, that was my personal Afghanistan is then not in the works, which implies that Russia wants a quick, decisive victory as opposed to a lengthy occupation. War by itself is a vehicle to reach a political objective. For the Russians, that means compelling Kiev to fulfill Moscow's will. Ideally, this would be the federalization of Ukraine's government. Doing so would preserve the country's territorial integrity while sacrificing its sovereignty. Specifically, by installing a federalized system, each region of Ukraine would be giving authority to decide its own culture, economy and foreign ties with neighboring states. There wouldn't be anything left for the central government to govern over. Moscow would gain the ability to play off the smaller autonomous regions to curtail the political interests of Kiev. It's divide and rule, if you will. A federalized Ukraine would virtually destroy all of Kiev's central power, resulting in the end of a unitary Ukrainian state. And though this political concession may seem better than conflict, in war you can be killed only I once. I guarantee someone's sexual preference has nothing to do with their ability or willingness to kill. No, no, I'm talking about how, like, there, there was that one famous, uh, there was that one tweet that everybody fucking dunked on where this lady was like, America's they, them army has, you know, is no match for Russian uh, military. And it was like showing like fucking rugged, uh, I think it was like not even Russian, I think they were like Chechens too. But whatever, it doesn't matter. It was like some fucking Chechen homies, Chechen looking homies uh in in russian garb uh fucking around <laughs>